fucking long. You are now tuned in to the real Coach JB. Slap it, podcast. It's the last chance for you. Last chance for me. Will I make it? Will I take it to the top? We gon' see. It's the last chance for you. Last chance for me. It's the last chance for you. Last chance for me. It's the last chance for you. Last chance for me. Will I make it? Will I take it to the top? We gon' see. It's the last chance for you. What up? What up? <clears throat> Real Coach JB here, Slap Dick Podcast. To your throat. To your throat. <laughs> no doubt. I'm a little under the weather. Shit. I'm a true Slap Dick right now. Um, we're at episode 16, man. Um, these things are flying by. We're getting back after it after a week off, man, of traveling and uh, getting going all over the place and getting this thing uh a little more nationally recognized. Still, uh, you're still sick from the fucking trip, huh? Yeah, man. Everybody on that damn plane God, was sitting damn. on the damn tarmac. Fucking American Airlines, man. Fuck me. Shit, we, we got to up our game and get the fucking front seats and better air Hell yeah. circulation. Hell yeah. Shout out, Nickel. Uh, so oh, anyway, <laughs> uh, Jay, Jay. Oh, who oh, that is? That's nobody. That? So... Uh, we, we're expecting a guest, so we're going to let you know when he calls in. We're going to do a slapdick style on the run, winging it, women it, yes, all that sir. shit. Quote of the day, man. What we fear of doing most is usually what we most need to do. Think about that shit and let that resonate a little bit. Shit, you um, need to get a new j- fucking job. Oh, shit. That's what I'm fearing the most. You need to get a job. Well, shit. Yo, it's fucking, you got to pay me with this shit. I mean, yeah, that's I'm yeah, a I'm you wish one hand. You fucking... Two more episodes, if you, you know what I'm saying? And that's it. I'm quitting. Wasting one hand, shit in the other, and uh, see what fill up first. Um, <laughs> so, you know, uh, trying to figure this whole thing out. We're waiting on a guest to call in. Yeah, crickets. Uh, don't worry about it. It's that big pod. We're just chilling right now. I'm going to get into it. Um, texting my, 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 my guest, I hope. Uh, Time that motherfucker's supposed to call in, man. Um. Right, he was supposed to call in already. Shit. But meanwhile, in meanwhile, between time, shit, what's been cracking in the sports world, man? Um, if you guys watch this cheer show on Netflix, uh, a little common uh, denominator is Greg Whiteley, the producer of Last Chance You. He produced a show called Cheer, and uh, there's this lady out there named Amanda Mole. She says, cheer is difficult to watch, and it exalts leaders who abuse their power. Um, she also quotes, quote, I quote, she says, quote, it's possible to love a sport and want a lot better for the people who play it. In response to a black lady who came out and said, I'm surprised in your comments based on the fact that you like football. And then she came out and said, she, liked, she says it's possible to love a sport and want a lot better for the people who play it. Well, that's not. That's a fucking oxymoron. She can't say that because she's never coached it. She don't know the world that we live in or the shoes that we walk in. And she's out there just another grown person out there talking shit, saying stupid shit about a space that they have no fucking idea what it entails, man. It just blows my mind that grown folks sit there and judge other grown folks that don't have nothing. That's like me calling in and saying... Hey, Spree, man, that fucking beat was off. It was it was a shitty. The hook was horrible. I don't know shit about right. music and production, so I can't say that shit. Right. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, Everybody. haters going to hate, man. man. And uh, so I texted the lady, uh, the cheer coach, and I told her, man, uh, hey, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm rooting for her. And, uh, you know, I, I think she did a great job. I mean, shit. She's depicted on the show much better than I was, I thought. <laughs> but uh, I think it was a good show, man. I thought it was a pretty good show. Uh, so you, you binge-watched that? We binge-watched it last yeah. night. And I posted a little thing on Twitter. I was watching it. And, uh, man, I thought it was a pretty good show. Greg Greg, Greg struck again, man. He, he's he's, he's uh, making quite a name for himself uh, in this uh, production world. He's, he's, he's producing some hitters. So... Um, what do you think about? And I'm, by the way, I'm going to have Greg Whiteley on our show next week. Um, great. So, so Greg will be on the show next week. It'll be a great one. We'll talk about Last Chance You. Talk about Cheer. Talk about Last Chance You basketball uh, at a former school that I used to coach at, Elac. 
So a lot of things on the horizon. Uh, a lot shit. of special the guests hat. coming up too. The hat, where he's gonna get pastrami and shit, huh? And them yeah. fries and shit. The original, me up. original hat. Um, yeah. What you think about Dwight Howard entering the dunk contest? And he's he's reached out to Kobe to uh, help him out with uh, some of his uh, antics. So what do you think about that shit? He's he's the oldest dunker. He'll be the oldest dunker in the contest by far. Uh, he thinks that uh, he's in the best shape of his life. He's also going on a two-week diet of some sort to try to even get in a better shape for the contest. Uh, now, he used to be able to jump out the gym for a six, eleven, seven-foot guy, uh, but it's going to be interesting. It's hard for long guys to really be dynamic. And, and, you know, Duncan's about that look. You know, Dominique Wilkins, the force of it, but, you know, six, seven, six, eight, not... Not seven foot. Seven foot, you're, you're at the rim. You're at the rim. So. I mean, it's, you got to be some special. You got to do some special shit. Yeah. And uh, I'm curious to see him because uh, he can jump and he is athletic, but 34 years old. I mean, you know. Fuck it. But hey, you know he, what, though? He, he reinvented himself already with yeah, the yeah, Lakers yeah. and shit. So. But you know Fuck what? It. Older people sometimes are wiser. Let's see if he come up with something that nobody else has done. I think I'm wiser, but shit, I'm fatter, older, yeah. knees hurt more. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, shit, when you're in that yeah. dunk contest. Yeah, you definitely can't go out shit. there and do no backer drills. <laughs> oh, I can get that in. I'll get me a one drill in. I'm sporting this. It's a great day to have a great shit. day shirt. Uh, CoachJBStore.com. Check it out. Go get the book. Hate me now, love me later. You can also Venmo me, Coach JB12, and get a personalized copy. Uh, follow Spree on social media. Yeah, yeah. Spreewell Inc. S P R E W E L L Inc. I N C. And uh, follow us on our YouTube channel. Make sure you're following us on that. And uh, we'll get our videos up, man. I know we've been lacking on the video part because we've been traveling and doing a lot of the things. So uh, you know we've had some great guests with Marcellus Wiley. For, um, last the other day, yeah. Clipper Nation, Max What's Crosby, up, Marcella? New Las Vegas Raider. Who that is? Ah, oh, shit. Let's see. What the fuck and you know on. we've uh, we've had some good guests on man lately. So uh, Eddie George uh, started it off for us, and you know I had Coy Dang, former player, Cal Berkeley, Pac-12 leading her in tackles, and uh, and so we'll see. Um, we'll see how this thing unfolds, but we're just getting going. Episode 16, like I said, um, we'll see if our guest calls in and then I'll let you know who it is. Cause I ain't gonna let you know who it is if the motherfucker flakes on me. Uh, <laughs> there's a new beef going on on social media. If you guys have peeped it out, T.O. and Donovan McNabb got something stirring. Uh, T.O. or Donovan McNabb was on a little show shooting some pool and he has being interviewed. Um... I think by Master Tess or some one of these guys, and he was like, you know, what, what happened, why he didn't win the Super Bowl. Donovan explained it his side of it, and then uh, he, and then, uh, you know, he's like, I think it was T.O. <laughs> because of how he went on the show um, the next year, you know, he goes on doing sit ups and push ups and shit. And made a spectacle, he thought, of the program. And uh, and so uh, so he thought that, uh, he thought that basically it was T.O.'s fault. T.O. hit up Master Tess on Twitter and was like, you want to know the real fucking story? Let's talk about the parties I used to throw, the DUIs you got, etc., etc. So there's some shit going on. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, uh, we'll see how that unfolds, man. Um, I got to meet T.O. at the big three basketball tournament. Um, I wrote a little something about him in the book. I told him straight up why I wrote that in the book. Uh, he, he, he told me he never got in trouble off the field, etc. I said, I never said you did. I just said that players follow the lead sometimes and when you're an NFL big time guy and you pull these antics I think kids young kids are very influenceable and they fucking follow they're very influential they follow what people do right wrong or indifferent and I had kids that used to emulate them <clears throat> and uh wanted to be like them and do sit ups push ups in the fucking street and do crazy shit like that and a lot of kids follow OBJ to this day the f fucking AB 
He's in more legal trouble, if you've noticed. He he beat up a. Fu- shit. I mean, this guy is a shit bird. Have we noticed? Let's let's just be real. This motherfucker's a shit bird, and uh, <clears throat> I try to stay in my lane, man. And uh, he's a fucking shit bird, man. I mean, this motherfucker needs to be admitted somewhere, or 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 somebody needs to beat the beat the brakes off this motherfucker, man. In my opinion, he don't pay a chef. He don't pay the fucking furniture delivery guy. At some point, <laughs> is it all their fault or is it, it going to be your fault ever? Like this motherfucker. He still got money? Nah, nah, he ain't going to have For it now. <clears throat> you know, I think the white folks are going to run him dry. But <clears throat> that's just me. Um, but man, go watch the the cheer show, man. It's pretty fucking good. Um, I think the this lady that's blasting the coach of the show is out of fucking pocket. I think she's uh, out, out of her lane. I think she's uh, ignorant, and ignorance is life-threatening. What's Coach she blasting? Like, what that, sport? No, the cheer show. Uh, the head coach of the cheer show on cheer. Oh, it's just a random lady blasting her. The cheer Some, some lady yeah, that's yeah. verified is blasting the cheer coach because, oh, you know, she's shit. a lady that gets gets after her kids and, and she's trying to get somewhere somewhere that, you know, the kid couldn't get themselves and that's the definition oh, yeah. of coaching. Get you where you couldn't get yourself, and fucking, she's doing that, and people want to be, you know, it's, it's we live in a soft Tree ass huggers, world, man. Tree kids soft, all that shit. <laughs> we live in a soft world, man. Another enabling fucking person that just can't handle real life shit. And every girl on the show is fucked up, just like my kids. It's JUCO. JUCO don't change uh, for, just because of gender, just so everybody out there is clear. JUCO is fucking JUCO. Mm. Um, it's not about gender. It ain't about color. Uh, I had a white kid on the show that was more fucked up than any black kid I had, and and then this guy got white girls on this show that's fucked up more than the black kids on the show. So, yeah, uh, gender has no uh, or poverty or upbringing, bad upbringing, uh, single family home, drugs, gangs. It don't have no color. Hell no. So you know, figure that shit out, and uh, why don't you be a part of the fucking solution instead of being a part of the problem, lady. Whoever the fuck's talking <laughs> shit out there. She probably don't help a soul in her life, but she wants to fucking sit there and judge everyone, man. Watch the show and eat your fucking popcorn, fat face. <laughs> um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, Eli Manning, he, uh, I don't know if it's free, you know, he, he says he's going to retire tomorrow, Friday, he's going to retire. Please do. Uh, today, fuck. actually, he's going to retire today. Thank you, um, Eli. It's been nice. Um, I think he won two Super Bowls, man. Shit, more than a lot of yeah. fucking people. Man, it's not easy to win Super Bowls, dog. Hey, this motherfucker won two Super Bowls, bro. He had the it factor for a long time. He played 16 years or some shit. I mean, he had the it factor? Yeah, yeah. Two Super Bowls, huh? I mean, shit to me, though. So, what did Romo do? I'm just saying. Two Super Bowls don't do shit to you, homie? Nah, I don't. I mean, he, so, I mean, who's better? he won. He was on the team. He was on the team. Yeah, he did. He did enough to you know fuck it up. Huh? You know what I'm he saying? Was a but he's not no fucking pro, fucking Hall of Fame. He wasn't Trent Dilfer, homie, dog. who just made one throw to Shannon Sharp to beat the Raiders on a 99 yard pop pass, dog. They didn't. He didn't need to throw. He like had to throw the football, homie, to win. I'm just letting you know. They had TQ. I mean, yeah, they had a nice team. They Eli's had defense. solid, homie. Eli's solid. He's, solid. he's not he's a Hall of Famer. He's a lot. I think he is. I don't it's, know. It's I, I, I don't know. I don't know if he's Hall of Famer. I think, he, you know, you can argue. Yeah, okay, nice is, is Kurt Warner Hall of Famer? No, you, you like Kurt. I'm mean, just saying. I mean, Kurt was nice. He won one Super Bowl, didn't he? He was nice. He's went, He went to three, won one, I think. Took Arizona to the Super Bowl, though. He took a fucking Cardinal team to the Super Bowl. I mean, does that really? I'm saying the Super Bowl, I, does that define I, I you? Mean, you know what I mean? I mean, it is uh, Tom Brady. If Tom Brady had no Super Bowls, is he fucking who we think say he is? I mean, damn, he won a grip. It wasn't like he just won one. You know what I'm saying? What so? Joe Montana won fucking. He had a lot to do with it. Why cats don't talk about Terry Bradshaw? Terry Bradshaw won the most. Why, why don't we talk about him? In that, like, as a play, I'm not. I go by skill set, man. I'm a little different. I'm not, Tony Romo had one of the top five skill sets in quarterback play, in my opinion. But he he don't have the it factor. He could never win the fucking playoff game. He was more skillful than Eli Manning. Yeah, I mean, I just think. What about Dan Marino? He never won Super Bowl. I love Dan. Dan never won Super Bowl. Dan's a dude. He just had Dan had the it factor that you said. He never had a Super Bowl. Never won one. I'm saying so that. that it, I don't impact? think that's what I'm saying. That the Super yeah. Bowl sometimes don't define your whole yeah, shit. I mean, does the NBA championship define? I mean, Charles Barkley never won. 
I mean, I'm just saying, I don't know. I mean, Charles Barkley probably would probably be bumped up as one of the greater players if he probably won a, 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 a ring. I don't yeah. know. I mean, uh, you know, Kobe's up there. Jordan's up there. You know, LeBron finally won on, on his, you know, moved around five different teams or whatever. So, you know, at least Kobe stayed at one team. Jordan, for the most part, until he retired and came back, you know. Wizards. Um, Go Wizards. <laughs> yeah. Four, I mean, four five. <laughs> I don't know, man. It's... That was garbage. It's interesting. Um, I don't know. I, I just, I, I don't know. I don't know. He had a nice career to me, though. Uh, sometimes um, you live off your people's name, the Mannings yeah. and all that. Yeah. Great white height hey, type 16 shit. 16 years in the league as a starter. Um, shit, man. Two Super Bowls. It's a, it's a better resume than probably 75% of quarterbacks playing today will ever have. Just so you know. Let's just be clear. Lamar Jackson may never win a Super Bowl. Deshaun Watson may never win the Super Bowl. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of cats out there that may never win the Super Bowl. Golf will never win the Super Bowl. I'm just saying, there's a lot of cats out there that will not have Eli Manning's fucking resume. So, you can say what you want, but there's a lot of cats that envy Eli Manning. I bet you that. I bet dollars to dimes on that. Of course. But he's a Manning. But Peyton, he didn't, Peyton didn't win his Super Bowls, though. The motherfucker That's won his own fucked Super up. The cat that should have had it. He won his own yeah, Super Bowl, huh? I'm just saying. Aiden is the guy. Donovan McNabb never won Super Bowl. I'm yeah. just saying. Vic never won. I'm not saying. Mm. I don't know. Uh, uh, what was ass at the dinner table? Um, in other news, Malik Henry, a former player of mine, obviously was nationally known, you know, for being a little controversial and, and, and so on and so forth from the show. Remind everybody he's still a kid. He, he, he played for me. He was 8, 17. <laughs> People don't realize he was already at Florida State as a 17-year-old. Yeah. <laughs> played for me 18. You know, he's like just turned 20, I believe. Uh, he started three games at Nevada. Um, he was, uh, he's been removed from the program. Um, I don't know anything about it, uh, so don't ask me. Are you uh, been removed? I don't know if he's been or removed just, or if yeah. he left. I don't know, uh -huh. so I don't want to put my foot in my mouth. I don't know, but he is gone. He has left the program. Let's just say that um, he's left the program. And uh, attitude, uh, I don't know. I mean, know. I mean, I don't know. Like, like you said, I don't yeah. know. But yeah, yeah. just watching him on some clips of yeah. the show, it's yeah. fucking attitude, shitty. Yeah, all the so, fuckers don't want to deal with that shit, dog. Yeah, so you know, it's it's just starts with going to class. Yeah, I don't want to do it. That's what I tell my son, my fucker. No, your attitude, get your attitude right. Yeah, attitude reflects leadership. Yeah. Oh shit. Be coach. Be coachable. You're not the yeah. coach at fucking 19, yeah. 17. Yeah, no. I shit. did the same type of shit too in junior yeah. college. Like yeah. I'm better than my fucking position yeah. coach. But you gotta, you know, but you gotta be uh, a little. You gotta have some humility to you, and. uh you know, it's kind of it's, it's different, but we'll see, man. We'll see how it goes. Um, I'm interested to see how this Donovan McNabb T.O. shit plays out. But Andy Reid, back in his second Super Bowl, Andy Reid was Donovan McNabb and T.O.'s coach that year that the Eagles went to the Super Bowl. Far and few between, man. It's very hard to get back to one. Andy Reid's second one. It's been 15 years in between, and uh, this will be a second Super Bowl. I hope Andy can get it done. I think the Niners' defense is good. Um, the running game is good, uh, or actually probably better than good on both sides. And uh, defense and run game usually win Super Bowls. And so if I was a coach and, and, and evaluating the film, I would say uh, Kansas City is so dynamic on offense, but they remind me of the Rams uh, when they were the you know the best show on best turf. Yeah. And they played a New England team that walked out holding hands together, were unified, and they beat that awesome offense and held them in check for the most part until Warner threw a wheel route, I think, to Marshall Falk late or something. But it was a close game, obviously, but the Rams were so loaded, more, much more loaded on paper. Similar to the Chiefs on offense, anyway. Um, it's going to be interesting in this game next week. Can the Chiefs just fly around and stretch the 49ers vertically? Um, or... Is the Niners going to control the ball, run the football, and keep the Chiefs in front of them? That's going to be the the big debate and the big task at hand for both programs, both both teams. 
And I'm interested to watch that game. Best offense in the league versus the best defense in the league. That's how it should be. And uh, don't sleep on the 49ers offense, though. I mean, uh, Shanahan's a great offensive mind, play caller. People forget he was the Atlanta Falcons OC when they should have beat the fucking Patriots a couple years ago in the Super Bowl. Uh, he had the best offense in the league that year for the Falcons. And... Uh, you know, hey, he, he don't have a lot of high-flying wideouts over there at the Niners. He's got Kittle. Uh, you know, a couple running backs been hurt. It, it, you know, it's the NFL, man. It's it's game 20 or whatever if you include pro season, preseason, regular season. You're, you're game 22 or whatever. I mean, this is that's a lot of football games at that level. And there's going to be some injuries, and that's just part of it. And uh, we'll see. Uh, I think the team that wins the game, though, is going to be the most healthy. Uh, a team that controls the ball and makes the fewest mistakes. That's just coaching talking, but that's just how it is, man. That the Super Bowl is very, uh, once those lights start to flash, it'll take them about a quarter or so probably unless a big play happens because somebody falls, slips and falls. But usually it takes a quarter for these teams to get acclimated and butterflies out and all that type of shit. So uh, Frisco has <clears throat> just been playing some relentless ball to me. I mean, I've been hating on them because I'm a Ram fan, but yeah. shit, the motherfuckers ain't letting up. Every time I think they're going to, you know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, wither away, the motherfuckers do their job. I mean, and whooping cats ass, too. KC always yeah. start off the slow, yeah. let's get to it at fourth quarter. We do some amazing, amazing but, shit, but shit. I, I think last Frisco just going to jump on them, dog. Ooh. Last two weeks, we saw the Chiefs start off slow and come back and score fucking 50 and Come back and score 35, you know what I mean? They're scoring so fast, it's it's hard to stop. And if they get going, uh, the Niners are going to get out their game plan. They, they can't run the ball that much if they're down 14 nothing to the Chiefs because they're going to have to throw it, and now you're in a Chiefs. Mm, got to do the Chiefs. Rely on pretty Jimmy, huh? Yeah, and I don't think he's that guy. I think he's a good manager of the game, and I think, you know, uh, that type of shit, I just don't know if he's the guy to, to, to go out there and just dominate and pick you apart and fucking just get you a big lead. I don't think he, that's he's him. a Eli, huh? He's going to have to throw for more than fucking whatever he threw for last game, 100 yards, if that. He's going to have to throw for more than that uh, to win this one, in my opinion. So they're going to have to throw the ball. The Chiefs proved they stopped Derrick Henry second half. They made an adjustment. Um, Did they stop him or they, they or, or him. the Titans just got away from what uh, they were supposed to be doing? They shouldn't have. They were up. Uh, I mean, fuck, they were up 17-7. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, he had 67 yards in the first half. Mm -hmm. He ends up having seven or something in the second half. So, I mean, so they just adjusted to that shit and then got after him? I mean, you can do it. Man. But, you know, it's going to be interesting to see how uh, how the Chiefs uh, react to the Niners run game and the play pass and all that stuff that Shanahan's going to throw at them. And it's going to be interesting to see the Niners are they going to drop eight and rush fucking three? Or are they going to try to get with them with their front four, which they're very capable of? Uh, but the Chiefs O-line's pass protection is very, very good, keeping Mahomes clean. So, but uh, we'll see. We'll see. We got a guest coming on, I think, that's going to uh, have a lot of insight on all this stuff. Um, has a personal uh, relationship with a lot of these mentioned, uh, aforementioned players that I'm discussing, especially the quarterback guy. So, uh, it'll be a good a little, good little um, guest to have on, a good little conversation we're going to have. But, um, you know, we'll see. Lakers beat the Knicks last night in the Garden. Um, and uh, after being blown out by Boston in the Boston Garden a couple of days ago, uh, LeBron was at his son's game and then jumped over and caught Went over to the garden, and then I knew that was a bad night. They were going to get beat by Boston. <laughs> Clippers got beat by a uh, Trey Young-less fucking <laughs> Atlanta team last night, which is a shocker. They were up big and lost. Uh, I noticed yeah. that. We pulled, uh, we pulled the horses out. Yeah, you can't lose to uh, those type of teams. So, listen, we got a guest speaker coming on. Um, we good? Yeah, yeah. We got the house. Hello. George, you got me? I got you. What's going hey, on, man? Brother? I know your time is valuable. I really apologize. Ah, no, nah, man. Uh, hey. I was draft training, and I had a guy go, hey, man, can I talk to you about something? <laughs> I got to make myself available for that conversation. Hey, no no excuses, Palmer. <laughs> no fucking excuses. Exactly. This is a slap group podcast. Hey. <laughs> no excuses, brother. Like <laughs> hey, this is a slap dick podcast, man. It's a, it, we, we, we take what we can get, brother. Yeah, yeah. 
Hey, I appreciate you, man. So, uh, so you so you let Slap Dicks call in. Perfect. Here I am. <laughs> I want to introduce you real quick, man, to all the audience out there listening. We're live, and uh, we'll, we'll obviously be able to fix this. But I got Jordan Palmer on, uh, former uh, <clears throat> UTEP. UTEP, uh, what are they, the Miners? We're the Miners, man. Miners, Everyone, miners. No doubt. No, it's not a shaka. It's a pick, man. No doubt. <laughs> hey, the the mighty miners, man. Uh, you gotta watch uh, watch the show, man. The, the basketball movie was a great, fucking movie. Uh, yeah, it was great. A great movie. Uh, former NFL quarterback uh, played for the Bengals, Jacksonville, Tennessee Titans. Um, now he's he's coached a lot of guys. Uh, Jordan's coached a lot of guys, man. He does uh, he does the quarterback summit. Uh, you the founder, Jordan? You the founder of that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, a little, my, my story is a little unique. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of coaches used to play, right? And a lot of us yeah. coach because we want to explain guys how to do it, how we would have done it if we knew what we knew now. Yeah, right? yeah no doubt. Um, so not really any different. Also, a lot of coaches steal stuff that they learn from other people and make it their own. Yeah. So I'm guilty of that as anybody as well. I played for some great coaches with some great players. I played for some shitty coaches and some shitty players. Yeah. And, um... That's learned. I mean, honestly, just as much from both. No question. And uh, and so, yeah, I run camps. Uh, I got a nice little gig, man. I, I coach kids starting at ten years old, all the way through their tenth year in the league. Uh, the way that looks is uh, my camps, QB summits. I run a handful of them. Starting to move around the country a little bit this year, and it's from ten year old to, to seniors in high school. But I bring in the top college players as counselors. Yeah. So past college counselors are guys like. Jared Goff, Patrick Mahomes, Deshaun Watson, Sam Darnold, Josh Allen, Kyle Allen, Drew Locke. So we had a lot of a lot of great players. Joe Burrow was a counselor with last year, and um, and so it gives me a chance to work with some of the college guys, give them things to think about, um, and then uh, usually my NFL guys show up and help out at those. But right now I'm in the peak. This is my third week of draft training. So every year I pick three quarterbacks. Uh, usually one or two of them are the top. Top quarterback taken, but I also love training the guy that's going to go undrafted, getting him ready to rock. No doubt. Uh, so I usually have one of the top picks and somebody go undrafted. So I pick three quarterbacks, and um, and then I have a veteran program starting in middle of February, where a lot of my guys that I used to train for the draft come back as NFL vets. So, like I said, I got ten year olds, and I got guys that are you know thirty three and working on a third contract. No and uh, I do it out of my hometown and in Dana Point, California. I definitely don't know more football than everybody. I'm not the best coach in the world for everybody, but I'm the perfect coach for certain guys who are on their quarterback journey looking to take a step. No doubt, no doubt. Oh, shit, I appreciate you coming on, man. A lot. So, a lot of, so we get a slap dick uh, discount for that for our kids, right, Palmer? <laughs> <We> get... Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. My boy 13, man, so uh, he, he, he might be heading your way uh, one of these days. Send him out. Yeah, yeah. Send him out. Hey, I know you played for a great man, a good friend of mine, Mike Price. Uh, Aaron Price, I'm sure, was a youngster on that staff. I don't remember if he was, but... Um, he was my quarterback coach. Yeah. He was one of my best friends coming to college. There you go. So, I was right. So, yeah. Um, so, some great men, man. Uh, Mike Mike coached a good friend of mine, Derek Sparks, at Wazoo, and ended up playing for the Niners and uh, running back. Went to modern day uh, <clears throat> before, shoot, maybe right before your brother. Uh, time I think he was 89 grand I think so he's old, he's older than me even um, but uh, I know he's a great human being Mike was and stuff like that so I know uh, he played for a good one man and uh, and uh, so we're, we're glad Do you know the story about where Mike Price got his coaching philosophy from no no please tell me it's one of my favorite stories so Mike Price people sleep on him man he was one of the best to coach for a while mm -hmm. he was recruiting he was in the Rose Bowl at Wazoo. It's a hard place to recruit to. Hell yeah. And uh, and uh, way back in the day, I think he was at Weaver State where he started. Yep. And uh, he used to be a hard-ass coach. Never gave positive reinforcement. Nothing was ever good enough. He really used to be like military style, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm. And um, he had this walk-on kid. I think he was a walk-on. I don't remember the guy's name. It was a long time ago. And uh, this kid was like the perfect kid. He did everything right, and for some reason, Mike's like, my MP's like, man, I used to, I rode him, he was my example, so I rode him harder than anybody. And uh, I basically needed him to do better than perfect, because I used him as an example for everybody else. 
and I thought it was working. I was a young coach, and that kid went home for Christmas break, drove through the path, and died in a car accident. Uh. And I was never able to tell him that I, I would have done it at the end of his career. I was never able to tell him, man, I appreciate how hard you're working. I think you're doing a great job. Man, mm. keep, keep working on these things. You're going to make it. Mm. And, uh, and he had uh, Christmas off and completely changed 180 degree his coaching philosophy because when he tells me that he used to be that way, I didn't understand it because he was the most fun coach I've ever played for. Right. The most positive environment. <laughs> he let, let got young men become men. He, he, you know, he, he'd love you up one side and rip your ass down the other, but he was always was a positive environment. And so for here, to hear his story about how he flipped that, as I was a player knowing that I was going to get into coaching in some capacity, um, Man, I, I'm, all, I'm completely on the positive side. I don't tell guys to stop doing anything. I try and move them towards things. No doubt. I believe that everybody's trying to get rid of bad habits, right? No on no the doubt. field, off the field, in the classroom, in the weight room, whatever. So I don't believe that you can just stop a bad habit if it's a, if it's a strong habit. You have to replace it with a different habit. So yeah. you got to take a bad habit. If you overstride, that's a bad habit when you're throwing. Yeah. But I don't want to tell you to stop overstriding. I want to tell you to, to start short striding. Yeah. All right, so I got a lot of that coaching philosophy from MP, man. He's uh, he's one of the best to do it. No doubt, no doubt. Yeah, we're gonna have to hook up, man, and talk some QB stuff. You know, that's my spot. That's my shit too. So we, I got shit. I got three playing now. Uh, well, my third one just retired, but uh, Brad Sorensen, he was Rivers' backup at yeah, Chargers for a while. Uh, one of my JUCO kids. <clears throat> um, so yeah, man, I was thinking about doing my own deal too, man. I was just. Especially after not coaching this year for the first time in 25 years off as a player and a coach, I said, "Shit, man, I don't know what I'm gonna do." So, so we started this slap dick podcast. Everybody requested, it, and now it's been going pretty good, man. We had Marcel, Marcellus Wiley on the other day. Eddie George. We've had some some guys. One of my, man. Lone, one of my lone original Clipper fans, me yeah. and Marcellus, man. <laughs> oh, you're a Clipper too, fuck. Oh, shit. Everyone's oh. on our bandwagon now. Yeah, Sorry, man. it's full. You can run behind it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this guy, my, my co-host yes, Spree here, man, he's a, he's a Clipper fan, man. I just don't get it. I don't get how you guys like being a JV team, but hey, it is what it is, man. Um, <laughs> hey, I'll tell you how I started off. Yeah. I was a senior in high school, 2002. Lakers were rolling. The Kings were rolling. Yep. None of us knew where Golden State was. Right. <laughs> and everyone, I didn't. I was barely following basketball. And my my girlfriend at the time, my wife now, she's a diehard Lakers fan. Her, her she had the grandma who like never missed the Laker game on the couch, you know, mm-hmm. and. And I was like, well, if I'm going to be, and I was going off to school in Texas, and I'm like, I'm not going to be a Mavs or a Spurs fan, or Rockets or whatever. I was like, man, I'm riding with the Clippers. <laughs> I'm just, be from here on out, man, I'm going to be yeah. a Clippers fan. They're terrible. It was Quinn McGetty, Elton Brand, <laughs> um, Candyman, yep. Ola Candy, yep. Quinn Richardson. And I was like, man, I'm riding with these guys. And it got fun about five years ago when we had Lob City, and it's about to be real fun this year, JB. Eh, oh, yeah. I, hear you. Oh, yeah. I don't think they could <laughs> I still think stars win championships and you know AD and, and LeBron are just too good in the, in the seven game stretch for me but you'll see man I mean shit Clippers are good I mean they're solid I think uh, it's going to come down to the, our bench is too deep for yeah, Lakers man yeah, I think. bench ain't going to matter man when, anyway that's a whole nother deal but <laughs> uh, who you got in the Super Bowl man oh man I've got Kansas City for a while man I I uh Especially after that win versus, so I've worked with Pat and I've worked with Deshaun, and and those are two of the most competitive and mature for their yeah. age. Those are the two things my eyes go to when I'm evaluating the guy for the NFL. Because uh, yeah. part of this is like the guys I take in the for my draft training, I want to be right. Right. You know what I mean? Your resume. Like, right I don't. Yeah. 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 It's like I, I get more juice out of being the guy that was telling everybody that Kyle Allen was a baller. Right. You know what I mean? I didn't need to tell anybody that Sam Darnold was a baller. That's fine. That was going to sort itself out whether we ever met or not. Yeah. But I get more juice out of that. And so, you know, with Pat, the story was Carson and Cliff Kingsbury were roommates at the Combine. Yeah. Way back. Uh-huh. And I didn't even know Cliff. And Cliff knew what I was doing. And he's like, hey, man, I got this sophomore thing here. I don't know what to do with this. This dude is a freak. It's weird looking when it comes out. His feet are all over the place, but he does a couple of things I've never seen anybody do before. Really? So he sent them out to me. Mm. And uh, so just spending time with Pat, understand the way he ticks. Um, you know, down 24 in that game versus Houston, right? That's pandemonium and chaos for most guys. No doubt. Wow. 
But that's a shootout. That's Texas Tech. Right? Right, like, right, right. That happens all the time. No, they, didn't tackle, they tackle like eight dudes in the whole season, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. And so, like, he thrives in those situations, right? And he's a neutral thinker. And I, I'm big on the sports psychology side of coaching quarterbacks and neutral thinking where you're grounded in fact. You're not positive thinking, convince yourself that everything's great all the time. Right. And you're not negative thinking, convince yourself that this 24 points is too many, right? It's just neutral. Hey, we score on this drive. Now it's 17. Yeah. Right? Get a stop, score again. Now it's 13, you know, whatever. Right. 13. Mm-hmm. So, uh, 10. So, uh, he's a neutral thinker. So, with Pat, you know, they obviously needed to make, move, make some pieces around him on defense. But it's really just a matter of time with him. Um, his mindset is, you know, he's not trying to get paid. He's not trying to be MVP. Now, he does things that are going to get him paid. And he is up for MVP again. Right. But he's just trying to win. He's just trying to win Super Bowl, right? And so because he has that paired with a coach, and the key thing on Patrick was when he went to play for Andy Reid, Andy Reid is not going to try to get you to do it his way. Yeah. Mm. He's one of the biggest egoless coaches in football. No doubt. It's one of the first things I look for. Well, my son, I got two boys. When they're getting ready to pick a college, if they want to do this, I'm looking for the coach who has experience with the smallest ego. Yeah. And Andy Reid does not believe in doing it his way. He believes in finding the most optimal way for you to do it. So he's not hammering Patrick on footwork. He's allowing the different arm slots. He's allowing Patrick to be Patrick, and he's just getting better over time. And as good as Patrick has been playing, I think he's like three or four years away from peaking. No, I don't no. think he's really even got it yet. No question. Which is scary for the AFC. Yeah, Amazing. I see that same thing. That's why I tell people all the time, man, coaching is fucking overrated. Uh, coaches lose games, players win them, man. Uh, mm. People don't realize that. You get the best player and get them to go through a wall for you because they believe, then shit, man, you got a good thing going. But, you know. Uh, well, flip that game to the other side. Look at Houston in that game. There's some real issues with clock management and decision making that was not made from the, anybody on the field. <laughs> uh, the sideline, hey, right? Yeah. Did we, you know, not going for it. Yeah. It was like fourth and one, didn't go for it. Yeah. And then Deshaun convinced them, and then you know, punt it, whatever. Yeah, like the fake punt that worked, but come on. Yeah. So yeah, there's just those things too. Yeah, and and uh, and I do think the world of Bill O'Brien. I think you know he just has a lot of jobs. He's GM, head coach, and play caller. But uh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I got I got I got, uh, I got Kansas City. Mm. Huh. Yeah, I, I'm torn. I don't, you know, I know. It reminds me. I have that feel of the Rams, uh, New England year uh, when the, when New England came out unified and won that game, when the best show on turf, the Rams trying to get their second bowl, and you know, kind of reminds me of that feel. I mean, a, a ball control offense led by a guy that's going to manage the game uh, in Garoppolo, and then you know, run the football well, and then uh, you're going up against a vertical threat team, and, and now if Mahomes comes out and Kansas City's up 14 nothing, the fucking game's over, because Garoppolo, to me, can't come mm. back and do what Mahomes can do, but <laughs> but that's just different. That's just, we'll see. I mean, it's interesting dynamic, number one offense, number one defense. I mean, and I don't sleep on Shanahan. I do know he's a great mind as well over there, so even though I, I think it's going to be a great Super Bowl. I yeah. mean, I think... Yeah. I'm excited to watch these coordinators go against each other. I think it's going to be a very low-scoring first quarter. Me too. Everyone's going to be sorting it out, throwing it in, yep. attacking each other's protections. Quarterbacks going to have to throw the ball out of bounds or, or scramble on third down the first couple third downs of the game. Everybody's these are four of the best coordinators yep. in the game. Period. Yep. They got two weeks, and there's been private staffs getting ready for the last month, right? Mm. So because they have they have analysts breaking down San Fran three weeks ago, right? So. You're going to get everybody's best shot, right? This is this is the, the biggest card of the year and the best two fighters that are going to go ahead and jab a lot in the first round. You know what I mean? Chess, um, chess match. And then I just think I think Kansas City is just going to outscore them. Um, it's, they, they just, they're turning it in to, to, to pick up basketball, you know? And if <laughs> we can just outscore you and continue to outscore you, um, then we're going to end up with more points at the end. No, and uh, I think that's the mentality. And when you come back from 24 versus a team like Houston – I think you. I think you start to feel invincible, and um, that's yeah. when that's where places for me was after that game. Um, kind of like with LSU, when you beat the brakes off of Oklahoma that bad, yeah, you're just not going to lose to Clemson. Yeah, I don't hard. care how good Clemson is, yeah. you're not going to lose to them. Yeah, no, I hear you. I picked Clemson too, man. <laughs> Shit, but yeah, thirty games in a row, and uh, I love what Dow was doing with the program, but. 
I, I'd be rem, I'd be remiss, man, not to ask you this. I mean, you know, uh, obviously with the show, and uh, we have a common uh, denominator and a kid. I know you had an Elite 11 kid, uh, Malik Henry, obviously. Yeah. He uh, was a great talent, arm talent, and all that stuff, and smart as hell and, and all that. He just, you know, I, I, I equate quarterbacks – uh, all great play, player uh, people. I don't care what if you're a Fortune 500 company CEO or a football quarterback or a, a point guard. You all you you have to have what's called the it factor, which I kind of define by calling it an executive presence. You know, and uh, I tell people all the time that's the guy that we pick on the basketball team when we're flipping coins, and 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 that's the first guy we want on our team or. Who the prom? Who the who the prom queen wants to take uh, to the prom, and you know that type of shit. It's an executive presence, and um, I just don't know if he ever had that. Me and Lane Kiffin talk about it quite a bit because we were discussing if he was going to try to bring him up to FAU, and uh, we discussed it. But he got removed, or he or he did leave himself. I don't know yet. I haven't looked into it, but he left Nevada yesterday uh, for whatever reason. You know. Um, I know you had him in Elite Eleven. What, what's your thoughts on Malik, man? As far as just uh, this is his eight. This if he does leave, which he has left Nevada, it'll be his eighth school, um, and he's just turned twenty. You know what I mean? He went to four high schools, Florida State, played with me at Independence, Nevada. So you're talking eight schools. I mean, I mean the success rate of that just probably against the odds. I mean. What, what what how, what'd you think about him when you coached him as a youngster? I know you had him as a youngster, and you know he's a big, big five star, highly recruited kid. Um, I just think uh, I think he should. I think he graduated too early and went out to Florida State as a mid year guy, and, and and did did the did the sexy thing and left early. And, and California kid going to Florida was mistake one to me. But how how do you feel about it? Well, I, I think, you know, Malik falls into a category of a, of a lot of guys who, I would just say, mismanage their talent, right, one way or another. Now, bad, bad luck happens, too, right? Guys get sure, hurt, sure. you know, the coach leaves. Like, that, yeah, that, that's, that's just kind of like football, and yeah. we're all older guys. That's also life, by the way. Yeah, um, no doubt. But um, the, way I, the way I talk about it with guys is, and, and to be honest with you, man, Elite 11, yeah, we have all kinds of guys come through there, but like my QB Summit and for sure my draft training and definitely my my veteran training i don't end up with guys like malik i just they just kind of don't make their way to me yeah, yeah. um and uh, not that i'm turning a bunch of guys away but it just they don't end up getting to me sure um but what i will say is i am yet to see a quarterback make decisions one way off the field and another way on the field so i've yet to see the guy who off the field is a mess disorganized makes irrational split decisions, and most of them are wrong. And then on the field, studies, goes through his progressions on time, delivers the ball with timing and accuracy, and has all of his shit together for four quarters of every game. I've also yet to see a guy be completely buttoned up off the field, 4.0 GPA, winning all the awards, going through, doing every single thing perfectly, and then running around and winging it on the field. Mm, Right. How you make decisions off the field directly correlates to how you make decisions on the field. So let's use Jameis Winston for an example. Okay? Yeah, I was so I think Jameis's problem is that he is a reactionary thinker, meaning he will react and then go, oh, shoot. Hmm. Should I have stood on the table and said that out loud yeah. with camera phones around? Right. Oh, <laughs> should I have said that to her? Should I have done that to him? Mm-hmm. And he also just broke the record for interceptions. Right. So, and and I and the guys, Peyton Manning buttoned up off the field, well, he plays quarterback the same way. My brother is, he doesn't do a lot of, he never did a lot of marketing. He hung out with his kids all the time. He worked the exact same. Every February was the same. Every March was the same. Every week three was the same. His preparation, he had a lot of injuries. His rehab was the same. Same person doing it, same location. So the mm. way he orchestrated his off the field, his kids look you in the eyes, they shake hands, they say, nice to meet you, sir. The way he raises his family, well, that's exactly the way that he plays football. Mm. And so how you make decisions off the field is going to mirror the way you make decisions on the field and vice versa. And, and maybe I'm wrong, and I don't know. I just haven't seen that yet. And, mm. and so then you add in adversity. Okay, and there's levels to it, right? I've trained Deshaun Watson. That's like real adversity. I played with Chris Henry, who had real adversity. And then 
you know, my brother, who didn't have a lot of adversity, but he, the, the two-time detour is ACL was first round of the playoffs, and then when they were 10-1 and one in Arizona. No. So there's levels to adversity, right? Yep. How you how you mitigate and and persevere, whatever you want to call it, like how you mitigate adversity? Because there's two things. Mark Trestman in Chicago taught me this. There's two inevitable things that will strike a quarterback. That's the inevitability of success and adversity, and you have to be good at handling both of them. Okay. Right? And so when you get a guy like Malik, it's how do they make decisions off the field? I'll tell you how they're going to read that play. Right. 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 If, if I tell him be here at eight and he's here at nine and has a bad excuse, then I'm not expecting him to have his eyes in the right spot either. Right. Right. Or I, he's going to change the play and do his own thing or whatever he did on your season. Right. Right. Because right. like, uh-huh. that's how he makes decisions. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, now you can address that if you get in early enough and you have enough influence and they have enough to lose, and you know this, and if they're willing to listen. Right. But if not, it's just a dead end. Yeah. Right, and so if I'm the next school evaluating Malik Henry, I'm sitting here going, "Can I solve for how this human being makes decisions?" But I don't care how strong his arm is. No, that, that everybody has that. Yeah, yeah. One yeah. of the elements. Yeah, yeah that shit. Yeah. Every every corner, right? Yeah. On one of my summits, you'll see six kids you like. You yeah. know what I mean? No doubt. That's no question. And you know, there's no, uh, you know, there's no room for. For any of that shit in a quarterback's job description, man, that's what I tell my kids. I said we don't have the D, we don't have the wide out or the DB job description where we could go be a fuck stick. Uh, we we are the goat or the fucking hero. It's no, there is no gray area with us. And so, um, you know, that's just kind of uh, what I used to tell him, man. And I just thought when I got him, he was pretty much damaged goods. And I told people, I said, hey, I think he's damaged goods, man. It's tough, and that's why I didn't put my name on him when. He went to Nevada. I mean, I didn't, you know, like, I'm going to keep my resume just like you are. Um, I want to, I've never had a kid kick, kick, get kicked out of a four-year. I've never had a kid get arrested after he's left me. 227 Division One kids, 27 in the NFL. I've never had a kid get kicked out or arrested. And I want to keep it that way. And that's just how you are when you're evaluating these guys the same way. You want to make sure that the Kyle Allens of the world, uh, you know, shit supersede your expectation or, or make it make it work. And so that's a uh, kudos to you and what you're doing. And uh, so, you know, I think it's a uh, sad situation. But at the same time, man, you know, I, I grew up in Compton as the only white guy, man. I mean, you, you eat or get eaten and uh, you, you figure shit out, turn over rocks or, or, or quit. You know, a lot of people want to bitch and moan and feel sorry. But, hey, shit, go get eaten by the big fish then. But, you know, um, it is what it is. Well, the, the position is too competitive now, right? So <laughs> think back to, like, so I'm 35. So, like, and Carson's four years older than me. So, like, in that zone, okay, when we were growing up, okay, you know, four-year difference, whatever. You kind of used to have to be six foot four, right handed, yeah. yep. from one of these eight colleges, yep. three year starter. They'd love for you to be a senior. <laughs> you know what I mean? When you're yep. coming out for the draft. Yeah. Bro, we got five eleven dudes winning Heisman's going number one. Yeah. And deserving it. Uh, yeah. We got a lefty from Hawaii who's gonna be a great pro and won a national championship. Yep. We got kids from North Dakota State going number two overall, signing a hundred and twenty eight million dollar contract. Yeah. Mm. So it's now when? equal opportunity. And the democratization of information, how available it is, I've said for a while, quarterback's going to be a black position. It's just a matter of time. As soon as the coaching can get to the hood of the kids who can't afford it, yep. mm-hmm. it's going to be a black position. Mm-hmm. Now, it's it's expedited, right? And it's gone faster. The three highest paid quarterbacks in the league, <laughs> and we got Patrick and Deshaun on deck this offseason. Yep. Okay. Like, Russ Wilson has the biggest contract. Lamar Jackson is the MVP. Go go look at college. Cool? Mm-hmm. So, what's happening now is... And Dak's going to get paid. Kids from, yep. And Dak's going to get paid. So, it's like, it's not just the quarterbacks from USC and Texas and these six schools. Like, if you're not good enough, there's a bunch of other guys that are. And with 7-on-7 seven seven and social media, like, the reason that SD can't recruit in Southern California is because when Carson was being recruited out of Southern California, all he had was five visits to evaluate these different schools from around the country. Yeah. He didn't know what Tennessee was. Yeah. He didn't know where it was. He didn't have Google Maps. And we didn't have social media going, yep. damn, that place looks sweet. Yep. And so <clears throat> you got kids now going, no, I actually kind of know what Clemson looks like. I follow all these guys. I watch all these games. And so the competition of the players 
Then you add in seven on seven. These kids are just throwing and completing more balls at an earlier age. Yeah. But one of the things I do with quarterbacks is we learn every defender's responsibility in every coverage. Yeah. Okay. So a quarter safety, he does not have quarters. Right. If I told you, go play safety, it's quarters, and I said, you've got this quarter of the field, what, are you going to backpedal and stand there? Yeah. That's mm. not enough information. That's like me saying the wide receiver's job is to run and catch. Well, right. yeah, but that's not enough information. I can't go play now. Right. But no, the quarter safety has outside gap run contained. If two goes vertical beyond 10 yards, it's man-to-man coverage. If he goes across the field or to the flat, his eyes go to number one. Yep. Okay, so the way that I just said that, I got a lot of eighth graders <laughs> saying that. Wow. Verbatim. Right that's so why by I, the time I, that eighth grader, I got a kid, Dylan Mills. He's an eighth grader, and everybody in Southern California wants him to come to their high school. Well, for Dylan Mills, there's a lot of coaches that he's going to meet with when he's picking a high school where he actually knows more. Mm, right. Okay, like, straight up. No doubt. Now, he doesn't have the experience. Right. But I don't think most high school office coordinators are going to tell you what the safety has in quarters. No. I don't know a lot of college coaches learn either. College, I'm going to so, tell you the Bill truth. Belichick, <laughs> they don't know, man. They don't know the difference between cover no. two and quarters. They, nobody does. I'm no. talking about co- there's college coaches out there that don't fucking know the difference between quarters and cover two. And uh, well, when I have college guys out for my son to be counselors, we dive really deep into that and how to do film study. And I, very regularly, I, and these are big time schools, very regularly, I get a call from the quarterback's coach going, Hey man, my guy came back. He started sharing this. Can you can you kind of break me down this? Wow, no doubt. So, and so with that, my point is like, there's more coming. Now they're not just coming from the rich white neighborhoods. Now they're coming from everywhere. Yep. They're more polished. Uh, one of my best buddies, Quincy Avery, private quarterback coach. He'd be great on this podcast. You know, he he worked with Dwayne Haskins last year. Deshaun now works with him in the off season. Huh. And like, and he spends a lot of time with dudes from the hood. Yeah. And the reality is, is like, <laughs> these guys are next. Right. Mm. And they're balling right now. He works with Justin Fields. But, like, it's now completely equal opportunity. You don't have to have a, an expensive private, private quarterback coach anymore. Like, yeah. if you're good, people will train you. They'll come after you. And, and if you get a big social media following, a lot of people will train you. Yeah. Right? They want you there. And so it's mm. just it's going to get more competitive. So going back to Malik Henry, it's just like, if somebody gives him the eighth opportunity, I don't know, but I doubt it. Because there's probably other dudes where I'm going, man, I got, Hell yeah. you know, I got this kid for four years. He's, he's yeah. insane, you know what I mean? And he, he, he may not throw it or do this as good as the league, but yeah. I do know what he's going to do. He's going to be yeah. coachable and he's going to be yes. X, Y, and Z, and uh, I'm going this way. He's going to sit in the front row in class and fucking, he's going to go to class and be on time. And He's going to be what I think he's, what, 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 what I want, what I expected him to be. Yeah. I always tell guys during draft training, the goal is not to go number one or high. The goal is to be as trustworthy throughout the process as possible. Wow. You know, I spent time with the guy Jordan Love, um, who got yeah. who got in trouble at his bowl game. Yeah, and he's killing it in Mobile this week. And you talk to kid? Yeah, but right. I spent enough time with him to realize that yeah, he got in trouble at the bowl game, and it, it's uh, you know it's in the news or whatever. Yeah, but but that was a, that was an isolated incident, and I don't think that he is a reactionary decision maker. I actually think he makes great decisions. He's now got pieces of people around him in his life. They're going to pour into him, yeah. so I'll bet he's going to come out the other end of that. So I actually do think he's a first round pick. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. But if you just Google him, you go ah, like no, right. there's more to the story. Right. And at the draft, they dig real deep, and they're going to go, "Ooh, this guy's better than everybody thinks." I actually trust this kid, and I think he's going to be better than ever what what we think. And that's what they're looking for, and that's what colleges are looking for too. Because if the next class comes in and the one behind it, they both suck, then you're getting fired. So. It's about being trustworthy. No doubt, no doubt. What, what are your, what's your thoughts on this, man? Because so I was at, I did the high school thing. I was in the, one, arguably one of the best in the, you know, the Power Five, uh, Pack Five in high school at, at Long Beach Cabrillo. So we had Polly and Bosco, modern day. We had all those guys. We had a battle, San Clemente. We actually played Darnold. Uh, we had a beat at San Clemente, and fuck, he took a power read sixty on us, and uh, we mm-hmm. ended up losing at the buzzer, but. Um, what's your thoughts nowadays, man, with this whole fucking thing? You know, they, they named a rule after me in CIF. It's, it's crazy. So I had so many transfers coming in. And now kids are jumping shit left and right. Um, obviously, the, the parochial schools are taking over. Modern days, Bosco's. Everybody wants to play in the parochial schools, private schools out in California. But what are what's your thoughts on the transfer, man? I mean, is it is it just a, the enabled 
generation that we live in or it, the kids on you know not as competitive they just say oh i'm not going to play here year one as a freshman i'm going to transfer and i'm going to go to fucking here and then you end up at two or three high schools i see it every day even when i recruited the last four years of recruiting i'm like well, you went to three high schools in georgia you went to four high schools in south carolina it's happening everywhere and i and i do believe the seven on seven has a has something to do with that because it is now nationally uh, with the pylon and all these different things going on, but do you think it correlates and re and, it, and, it, and it carries over to the transfer portal uh, that the NCAA is facing? I mean, is it is it just a hard head equal soft ass generation, or wh what are we dealing with here with these transfers? Because you know, when we grew up, I'm 43, so I'm only a few years older than you and and, and, and Carson, but like. You know, I remember the Santa Margarita just was just becoming some something that no, we didn't even know who Santa Margarita was back then. We were like, "Well, who the hell is this?" We played, we were playing Laguna Beach and shit. I went to Artesia with the O'Bannon brothers and all that and basketball, so we were basketball power. But um, you know, I'm like, we could never have transferred. My dad would have beat my ass. I mean, like, I, what what is the deal now? It's just is it because of the, the smartphone era and the social media and everybody yeah. gets a hold of you and you know I'm, I'm, I've heard stories of cats offering you this amount of money at certain schools, not even private schools. So, I mean, uh, I don't know, man. I think it has something to do with the transfer portal because I think it's just an extension of high school now and they're used to transferring because they don't have it their way or or a coach just manipulates them and gets them. I mean, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I know it's an interesting topic now. I'll start this off with, I started at Santa Margarita and I transferred to Mission Viejo High School to play for Bob Johnson. I was the first transfer right. for Bob Johnson there at Mission Viejo. Okay. Um, now, I was a victim of daddy ball. We had a transfer come into Santa Margarita during my freshman year whose dad bought everybody <laughs> uniforms and put the lights on the practice field and all that stuff. So I saw the writing <laughs> on the wall, even though Carson had just left, and I wasn't very good. You know, I was 5'8 coming into high school. Yeah, yeah. Six, five. late bloomer, yeah. So I didn't know. Same with me, yeah. So, so, um, I'll say this. So, I'm a bow hunter, okay? I hunt white-tailed deer. My brother and I have a farm in Ohio. And it's it's fascinating. It's like, I love bow hunting. Because it, it's, you got to be really close to them. You got to do a lot of work in the off-season to get them to actually walk right there. They got to be about 35 yards away, for me at least. Um, and one of the things I've noticed with deer is they're, they're unbelievable athletes. Okay. Yeah. They can jump over an eight foot fence. They can run. They can haul ass. <laughs> right. Their eyes are amazing. They can see a million miles away. They smell you from a mile away. All that's crazy. But when there's nothing around them, they will walk down a little pathway that the one in front of them walks, and they won't jump or hop a fence. They'll walk all over to not have to jump over a fence. When they're just chilling, their natural instinct is to take the path of least resistance. Yep. Yeah. Mm. They can jump over anything, but they won't unless they're running for their life. And I just think it's the same thing I see. It's for the majority of these guys, it's not even about opportunity. You're going to, sure, you're going to have a kid transfer because the other guys are better than him or the same reason that I had, you know, or some kid's dad comes in, he's on the show now, and blah, blah, blah. Like, that, that's going to happen. I think that's isolated cases across the board. You're also going to have kids get money to go to certain places. I don't think that's the majority. I think those are isolated cases, right? Me too, yeah. Um, and uh, and then there's there's the, there's the majority though, and I think at the high school and college level it's different. The high school level, I think it is the path of path of least resistance. Yep. So where can I just be guaranteed something? Okay, so you call it soft ass, whatever you call it, right? Like, how do I just be guaranteed where I know what the outcome is going to be? I know how much I'm going to play. I know what they're going to do. I know how they're going to use me. Right. I think that's the majority of it. Because uh, I'm at the Nike opening every year, right? For, and the Elite 11, I've been around it since it started 20 years ago. And um, and it's becoming more and more that way. So there are isolated cases, and, and that'll always be the case. But the majority of them, I think it's just they're at a young age um, taking the path of, of least resistance. When it comes to the college transfer portal, I do think it's different. And I don't know, I don't follow all the DBs and DNs that are switching, but I pay attention to the quarterbacks. But for the quarterback, now you're sitting here going, okay, this is now a contract year for me, right? This last year was a contract year for Joe Burrow, okay? So Joe gets out here next week. I'm training him for the draft the next couple months. And when he left Ohio State, you know, he wasn't going to be playing. But he got hurt. Dwayne Haskins went in. Dwayne Haskins was the 15th second of the draft, right? right? I, you can say who's better. I don't care. But Dwayne Haskins was really good. No doubt. So 
So that was about finding an opportunity. That wasn't soft. That wasn't backing down to a challenge. That was, no, I'm going to go and play two years. I need a first year to, I need to play, and then I have a contract year coming up. You need film. So he needed film. He needed film, yeah. Yeah, and so Joe, you know, I think he would have been a fourth or fifth round pick this time last year, and now he's the number one pick. And so that was a contract year. And, uh, and, and, you know, he, he, he maxed it out. And you look at Jamie Newman transferring from Wake Forest to Georgia. Well, he's a starter at a Power 5 school, leaving. Well, now he's thinking NFL, what's going to get me the most ready? What's going to get me the most, the biggest games? So I look at that and I go, that's a good business decision. Yeah. I don't know much about Wake Forest, but I know a lot about Georgia. Right. Right? He's got George Pickens at wideout. He's got tight end. Eric, uh, whatever. The freak, they're going to have backs because they do. They got about six of them back there at all times that all of them can go. Yeah. So, and he's going to get coached up and they're going to play in the SEC championship probably. Yeah. So I look at that and I go, that's a business decision, right? Now, you got the guys who are trying to go to their third school and whatever. Again, I look at that as a nice little case. Malik Henry, uh, the kid who went from Vegas to Ohio State, who went to Miami. Miami like, yeah. ah, those are like, Tate those Martel, are like this, Martel. Isolated case. Yeah. Yeah, state. Isolated case, right? That's pretty specific to state. <laughs> Yeah, but the guys that are hopping shit for one or two years, you know, it looks like KJ Costello's in the transfer portal. Where is he going to go? Yeah. Well, it's a business decision now, right? Yeah. This isn't I don't like my coach or I don't like these uniforms. Yeah, this is what's going to give me the best chance to, to do this as for a living. And honestly, when you go to when you go to college, anybody you're going to college to advance your uh, your potential earnings, right? If you're going to get your your master's, you're doing it because whatever your career is going to be next. If you're a regular student. You might be able to make more money faster. If you're going to go to med school, I want to be a doctor. I want to make more money faster, right? And the NFL, I just think college football is the same. If you got a chance to go to the league and you've graduated early and you have a chance to improve your entry point into the NFL, I think it's worth looking at. But let me tie this whole thing together. There's The stats are crazy on NFL players and how broke they are afterwards, right? 80-something yeah, yeah. percent or broke within five years, yeah. whatever the stats yeah. are. Okay. I think it starts at the high school level. I think athletes are being trained to be entitled. No doubt. I don't think they're naturally entitled. I'll use me as an example. Okay, now I was a scrub. I, I played seven years. I started zero games. Okay, so I played. I was good enough to make it. Not good enough to really make it. Cool. So I'll use me as an example. I'm on the low end. I had one offer out of high school. I was a six round pick. Got cut right away. Signed an arena deal. Okay, so I'm on the low low point of making it. Okay. Mm -hmm. When I got hurt and was done, when I got done, I broke my ankle surfing. And I remember, and I still fight this entitlement, I remember having to book my own doctor's appointments and having to wait in the waiting room with everybody else and not seeing the best surgeon, just seeing the, the one they had available for me. And I remember fighting that, like, internally. Like, I deserve better than this. Because in high school, when I got hurt, they drove me around to the back of the building. Somebody drove me there. I went and saw the doctor. I was in and out. And then I went to college. Then I went to the NFL, right? So by the time you get done, now you guys get used to spending a lot of money. They don't know it. Just because they have money doesn't mean they know how to make it. And I just think the, the broke stuff at the end starts with entitlement. Because when you're in eighth grade and you got high schools recruiting you, and then you got colleges recruiting you, and a lot of guys are in high school are being recruited not by the school, but by the sororities on social media. Yeah. Use your imagination. Yep. Wow. Okay? So then, so that comes easy, too. And then now you got agents. Yep. Right? Some of them getting paid on the side, blah, blah, blah. Then they go to the league. Then, and then they get out of the league, and it's like, I don't know how to do anything for myself. Yeah. Besides take. Yep. No, I, I and uh, so it starts at a young young age, unfortunately. And I, and I and we can go further than that, man. I mean, a lot of these kids, I mean... <laughs> It's an interesting point you brought up with the quarterback because, see, recruiting, uh, it was rare that you get a transfer portal QB, especially at a JUCO level like me. I was trying to get the best players in the country. Obviously, most of my transfer portal kids were the wideouts, DBs, backers, safeties, D linemen, um, O linemen. Um, they leave a lot more rare and frequent, I think, um, than the quarterback. But I, I do agree with you about the quarterback. It's an interesting perspective. The quarterback for the money decision. But going back to high school, you know, a lot of these kids, man, where I'm from and, and a lot of the kids that you see transfer actually are single parent home kids that are 
uh, African American black descent, they come in and, and they, they're they're leaving because their home life is shitty, and they're going with the best thing possible, and the the, the, the you know the fastest, the least resistance, the path of least resistance, or somebody that's giving them something that they never had, um, or somebody telling the mom. Hey, I'll get you a job so so and so place if you can if your kid comes here. I mean that shit's happening and 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 we all know it and it's it's uh it's another interesting part of it and and it's just uh you know it's becoming an epidemic kind of just like marijuana is with the players. I mean that's just kind of it was an epidemic I thought uh, for me and um it's just uh it's unfortunate but shit sometimes man the truth hurts and it's just uh. It's a it's a rare it's a different world that we live in, man. I'll say it like that than when we when we were playing. That's for sure. It's just a different world, and uh, you know, what's your uh, Eli's is going to retire, man? You, is he a Hall of Famer? Yeah, I think anytime you win two Super Bowls, I'm not trying to hear why and how it happened. The catch on the guy's helmet. I don't know. He won those games. I'm with you. Hundred um, percent. Yeah, I um, I know it's. Some, somehow those guys are really identical guys. Him and his brother and Peyton ended up being everybody's favorite. And Eli's easy to talk to talk shit on, I guess. Um, but yeah, I think he's a Hall of Famer. I think he's just the amount of games he played. You know, just it's being being years. available on every Sunday. Yeah, never hurt, man. Hard. <laughs> I told hard. people that, man. I try to tell Spree here, my co-host. I'm like, I'm like, you know, there's 75 to 85 percent of today's players would will will end his career wanting Eli's resume and they'll never have it and that's what people don't realize that's that's a that's a stat people probably don't look at like Deshaun may never win a Super Bowl like Lamar may yeah. never win a Super Bowl like people gotta understand he won two of them look at Aaron Rodgers Aaron Rodgers he's won I don't know one if he's gonna get a second one no I don't think you will I don't think you will people ask me who the best quarterback is all time and I, I don't get into the whole all time thing because now you're talking about championships and stuff yeah I just say when if you took all the best ones and you had them playing their A game, whose A game is the A? And I take Aaron, and I think Aaron's got a really, really uphill battle to win a second Super Bowl. I agree. I agree. I, I kind of, me and Spree were talking about this. The winning the Super Bowl part is like NBA. You know, Charles Barkley never won a fucking championship. Is he? Would he be ranked higher if he had? If he did? I mean, I don't know. To me, Charles Barkley is one of the greatest players ever. I mean, at his six four, a true six four and a half. I mean, what he did. Um, I, you know, I, I equate that to Dan Marino. I mean, Dan Marino was. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a three quarter release guy, just like he was. We had a fast, quick release, and, and, uh, you know, slow, slow but quick foot, and you know, graceful in the pocket. Get, didn't take sacks. Uh, knew the coverage, get the ball out. You don't have to have a great O line. You know, I never had a fucking O line. I never got sacked, but um, you know, and I was slow as shit. But you know, I, at the same deal. I mean, you got to have that it factor. You know, Dan never won one. I mean, is Tom Brady considered the best ever if he didn't win these Super Bowls? If he didn't play in the AFC East? I mean, if he's in the NFC West all his years? I mean, I, there's so many factors, man. But and if is a fifth, we'd all be drunk too. But you know, at the same time, I'm like, I agree with you, man. I you know, I think. Skill set wise, Tony Romo was a top five quarterback, but he never won it. He didn't have that it factor. You know what I mean? I mean, I I I I just think that's huge. Eli had it at some point. I mean, shit, two Super Bowls ain't easy, and he didn't. He wasn't. Uh, no offense to anybody, but he wasn't asked as Trent Dilfer was on the on the Ravens to just you know fucking throw a tight end pop pass to Shannon Sharp and run the football with Jamal Lewis and fucking play the best defense in the NFL history, uh, possibly. You know. You know he could get away with throwing the ball five seven times in that in that in that AFC Championship game against the Raiders. I mean, uh, Eli had to throw the football, man. I mean, he was throwing the football around. You know what I mean? And he had to he had to fucking throw some tight covered balls and and throw people open. And people don't realize that. So I think he uh, I think he is. Is your brother a Hall of Famer? It's an interesting topic. Um, so T.J. Hushmanzada is a good guy to talk to about this because he's. Juco He's buddy, biased. Juco buddy, him, Chad but, Johnson, and Steve Smith were all Juco the same time me and three were at Compton. <clears throat> yeah, with, with Coach C, yep. Charles Collins. Yeah, Charles, Charlie, he's uh, an old Christian now, I guess. Yeah. Um, so, with Carson, um, look, I train the top picks for the draft, right? So yeah. I evaluate all, even the guys I don't train, I evaluate everybody. Yeah. Uh, I definitely have not seen one like Carson. Me either. I don't see any in the pipeline. Um, I've worked with Jerry Jones' grandson before, John Stephen Jones. Yeah. And uh, the great story, I was 
Carson had a Monday night football game in Arizona. He was playing for the Cardinals against the Cowboys. And uh, Carson's family's suite, you know, his wife's suite, was next to the opposing owner's suite. <laughs> so before the game, you know, I texted Stephen Jones. I'm like, hey, man, let's, let's, you know, let's link up, whatever. So I go over there. I'm talking with Jerry and Stephen before the game. And Jerry made a comment to me that stuck with me ever since. He goes, Jordan, I love what you're doing with the draft guys. I love this. Awesome. He goes, but you may never see one like Carson. I think Carson would be the first pick in any draft, oh. past or future. And I'm like, you know, at the time I was like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, let's go, man. That's a nice thing to say. Thank you. And I thought about it afterwards. Like, Jerry Jones doesn't say stuff like that. Right. And Jerry Jones, you may not like the Cowboys, and you may not think he should be. That dude knows what he's talking about. Oh, he's smart. <laughs> yeah, okay? there's a reason. <laughs> His whole life, he's been winning and doing yeah. this, yeah. okay? And the thing with Carson is that so much of it is where you go. And, um, and I'm not going to get into any Bengals stuff. But um, but I, I certainly never saw anything close to it. Um, his touch, the arm strength. I teach mechanics. Like yep. Carson was a judge machine. No doubt. Um, he's a winner. Uh, we, had a, we threw a surprise retirement party for him the week after the Super Bowl last year. And we invited like 60 teammates only. No friends or family, just teammates. Every single person showed up. Mm, wow. And throughout the course of the night, from Cincy to Oakland to Arizona, the number one thing that everybody told me came up, hey, JP, just want to grab you for a second. Man, just want to say, and everybody said the same thing, your brother is the best teammate I ever had. Bro, he was the best at working with you. Know, you got a young guy. Man, I, I was my first year in the league. It was his 10th. The amount of time he spent with me and how he helped me. There was DVs there, too. Mm, and right, right so to have the, you know six five two thirty five a hose he, was, he used to run around back in the day too yeah no to doubt. be a winner and he turned a program around at SC yeah. you know Pete Carroll gets a lot of love for that yeah but yeah. they also turned it with a pretty good quarterback one Heisman <laughs> um, confidence his self generated confidence was something I talk a lot about avoiding reactionary confidence having self generated confidence you know he's the most humble superstar I've ever been around. And um, and then when he when he left Cincinnati, he never did a single interview about it. He had his own differences with the owner, yeah. And he kept it private. And he got roasted for a whole year. Yeah, they're burning jerseys and stuff. And he just internalized it, compartmentalized it. He's a man of principle. He could have played two or three more years. They were begging him at the end, no doubt. And mm -hmm. he decided to be a family man. So just the whole package. Uh, no, he's not a whole famer mm. because. Now, he's 10th, 11th, or 12th in the three most important categories. But without a Super Bowl and because people's opinion and you win, you know, it's an award to be in that thing, right? It's not strictly analytical where they look at numbers and they yeah. say you're in. Um, no, I don't think he'll ever get in. I don't think he'll ever be up for consideration. But the guys who played with him, the reason I say TJ's a good guy to, to talk to you about this, TJ played with Carson, played with Matt Hasselbeck. But every offseason, he's worked out with Tom Brady, Aaron Rodgers, Staff, he's worked out with all the best quarterbacks, and he's yeah. just, he just—he has this play up. Tell you, Carson's the best ever. No doubt. I mean, I, I know. I. Hey, and so he, he reminds me. I'm a Troy Aikman guy. I grew up, you know, going shit, growing up watching Troy, and, and I think those two so are very, he. those two are very similar to me, man. So did he? Yeah. That was his guy. Yep, yep, and they're very the only similar. The reason he ended up being number three is because some kid at his high school had number eight. Had number eight. <laughs> <laughs> hey. And, and 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 it's similar, man, with the you know the carriage where the ball is, and and uh, everything is very very similar, man. And they're both fucking super accurate and um, same arm. I mean, shit, you know, they're very really really uh, they, they look like, man. And uh, but hey, man, hey, sh 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 plug your stuff, man. Let everybody know what you got going on and how people can find you. And and uh, I'm interested, man. We're gonna have to stay in touch too, man, and get together and split the mind up. Yeah. Now, it's easy for me, Instagram. It's just my name, Jordan Palmer, and also QB Summit has Instagram. Um, once I get to March, I'm going to be firing up a lot of content. So whatever's in my head, I'm going to be giving away for free. So it'll be all be on YouTube. So I'll look to launch that here in March when I get through all this draft stuff. And, um, yeah, I got camps uh, in Southern California. I have one in Ohio, uh, QB Summit. Um, and so people can just DM me, ask any information on that. And then it's fun, man. I, I coach January to July. And then everyone goes back to coach for their coaches. I don't coach guys during the season because I think they need to be listening to their coach, no, yeah, not the some way. dude on the couch. Yeah, from the same way. And um, but I do talk to a lot of my guys just mentally, sports psychology stuff. And then during the season, uh, I'm calling games for Fox, college football games. So I get um, uh, 
I, I learned a while ago that I don't I don't want to coach twelve months a year. So I pass on some jobs. Yeah. Um, this is a good fix for me, and I, I also I didn't marry a coach's wife, so I can't. <laughs> not looking to move. I live in Dana Point. I ain't moving unless it's closer to the water. I, I and uh, so yeah, I, I love working with young guys. And for me, I'm not about trying to get you better. Uh, that ends up being a byproduct. Sure. Um, I just believe that quarterbacks, any age, have a greater opportunity to impact people around them than anybody their age because they oh, get wow. dealt more opportunities at life than people their age. So the quarterback who's starting on varsity as a sophomore in high school, he gets more reps at pressure, expectations, following through, having to execute, all of these things, he gets more reps than the point guard mm. or the outside hitter on the girls' volleyball team who might be big time yeah. or the, the valedictorian. He gets more reps at that. Therefore, if I can train people to use their platform that they've been given, which is a little bit higher than everybody else's, if they can use that platform to impact the people around them, that's going to end up having a greater impact on their life and they're going to be more positioned for success moving forward. So one of the byproducts is kids spin it better and they learn more defense and they get better and they're more confident. But what I'm training them to do is utilize their platform for good. So if you look at a lot of the guys I've worked with for the draft, two things are consistent. One, they all play well early. Okay. Yeah. So Drew Locke, I was in the green room with him. Boy, did we think he was going to be a first round pick. Yeah. He was devastated. He went second round to Denver. And then he went 3-1 and one at the end of the year. Yep. Mm-hmm. Kyle Allen was devastated to not get an invite to the Combine and only have one coach show up to his pro day that he trained three months for. Uh-huh. Wow. Uh, but that was a Carolina Panthers coach. And when he went in last year, not this season, the year before, at the end of the season, week 17, at New Orleans, he went 26 for 33 for three touchdowns yeah. and beat New Orleans. Yeah, no. My guys all play well early, one. The second thing is, these guys are all impact guys. Deshaun just launched his foundation this offseason. We talked about it his junior year. Once you play two years, lock in, focus, establish yourself, and then launch your charity. Right. But he didn't come up with the idea this past offseason. Same with Mahomes, launched the, um, you know, his charity last year. So these guys are all big impact guys. They're looking to make a difference in people's lives around them, and I just think that that's going to pay bigger dividends. And uh, these are some of the most influential young men in America. No doubt. You wow. know? And I, this summer, I'm going to Europe. I'm going to start coaching over there, do some stuff in Germany and Vienna in yeah. August. And yeah. I think these are going to end up being some of the most influential young men in the world at some point. Huh. Well, shit, man. I appreciate it, man. Everybody got some great insight on uh, having you on, man. Again, Jordan Palmer, man. Uh, yeah. He's his own man. He's not just the brother of Carson Palmer, and he's done great things for a lot of people. And uh, I appreciate you coming on, man. And uh, we'll have to hook up, man. I'll, shit, let's go to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> I love it man thanks for having me on guys I appreciate it hey I appreciate it Jordan and we'll stay in touch brother